Hello everybody, in this video we'll be looking at Jeremiah chapter 17. So we're going to go through chapter 17 of Jeremiah, and I'm finally getting back at recording these after a long traveling season, and I'm home for the winter months, so I'll try to run these off more quickly, those that are actually following along. <clears throat> so Jeremiah chapter 17, and we can sort of break break it down or divide it up in, in the following way. Uh, verse 1 uh, down to the end of verse uh, 13. Uh, it's looking at the sin of Judah. And in fact, uh, it is expanded to look at the, basically at the sin of man, the heart of man. So the evil of man is um, dealt with here by Jeremiah, his evil heart, and the sins that uh, Judah in particular had committed. Now, actually, verse 12 and 13 is sort of uh, Jeremiah's conclusion uh, of that um, that look at man's sin. He gives his concluding thoughts on it in verse uh, 12 or 13. And then a new section opens up. Verse 14 to 18 is a prayer by Jeremiah. Uh, it's a prayer by him for deliverance from his enemies. And you get this throughout the book of Jeremiah. <clears throat> uh, Jeremiah will deliver a uh, a tough sermon, a tough message, and then he'll have a prayer uh, to the Lord for deliverance or for protection from his enemies, because he was sort of public enemy number one uh, in the land for his prophecies. And then the concluding section uh, it runs from verse 19 to the end of the chapter, uh, to uh, the end of verse 27, and it's um, an exhortation or a warning against uh, the breaking of the Sabbath. So it's about the Sabbath laws uh, that uh, Israel was under. Actually, uh, that section probably uh, should have been a, a separate chapter. Uh, we know that the, the chapter divisions, as we often say, the chapter divisions sometimes are arbitrary and don't always make sense. Uh, this is one of those cases uh, where verse 19 to the end of the chapter really is an entirely new uh, topic. A new occasion. So we'll just start. We'll look at the first section here. Uh, verse 1, uh, down to the end of verse 13. Um, and we see in verse 1, uh, <clears throat> it states, The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron with the point of a diamond. And it is engraved on the table of their heart and on the horns of your altars. So uh, the... the uh, the sin of Judah, that is the people of Judah, the Jews, uh, was was definite and clear. It was engraven on their hearts. It could not be hidden. And the the metaphor here is a pen of iron. And at the at uh, this at the end of this pen, really a stylus, uh, was a diamond. A diamond is one of the the, the hardest elements, you know, in 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 the material world. is very hard. Uh, it's believed, and I think they found some archaeological evidence to this is that these these uh, styluses with the diamond point were used to write on silver scrolls. Now this just would have been done at the highest levels of society that would have enough money for that, kings and so on. If they had a very important message, they would take this silver scroll and take this uh, iron stylus with, with the diamond tip point and, and write uh, the message on it. Well, this was written on the heart of the uh, of the uh, people of Judah, and as a record of their sin before God, and basically uh, verse two uh, to four uh, is dealing with their idolatry. Verse four says that they will go into captivity because of their idolatry, and this is a theme again and again and again in Jeremiah. He's warning about this because of their idolatry. They're going to be taken into captivity in Babylon. This is why Jeremiah is hated. He's considered a traitor for these types of words. So it speaks of the sin of the high places, that's idolatry, all within their borders, verse 3. And then um, at the end of verse 4, they'd be taken captivity into a land which you do not know. Uh, for you have kindled a fire in my anger, which shall burn forever. That's at the end of verse 4. <clears throat> uh, some have stated with this last expression in verse 4, uh, my anger which shall burn forever, and they describe it um, sort of as a hyperbole. 
that uh, that God is speaking in uh, hyperbole, in the terms of hyperbole. I don't like that expression and that view of it, because hyperbole always, uh, to me at least, uh, has the connotation of exaggeration. Uh, I don't believe God exaggerates. Uh, he always tells the truth. He doesn't have to exaggerate or elaborate. Well, then, how do we understand this? Uh, because uh, we know that God would forgive uh, a remnant of the Jews and, and, and bring them back from captivity. His anger was not on those people. So it says here his anger would burn forever. Well, uh, those who are unrepentant and those who continued in the idolatry, uh, many of them would have been killed during the Babylonian captivity and so on. And then you have the final judgment day as well, uh, that all men will stand before from the beginning of time. And it says that they'll be cast in a lake of fire and the torment, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. That's not, that's not hyperbole. You know, this is solemn things, a solemn thought. And so I don't believe there's exaggeration here at all. Uh, that uh, God's anger against sin is is real. You know, sin, when we sin, we just don't affect ourselves, okay? And we also affect those around us, our families, our assemblies, uh, the world in general. So uh, sin is a, a serious thing. And above all, from what it produces as fruit, uh, in our own lives and in the lives of others, it's against God ultimately and his glory. So uh, so this is not exaggeration. And then we get this statement, verse 5, Cursed is the man who trusts the man and makes flesh his strength. So it's a warning against uh, putting your hope or trust in man. Okay, uh, We don't need to look uh, to politicians as saviors to put our hope in them that they're going to fix things up. But, People continually uh, do this, but it's fool's gold. It's fool's gold to put your trust and your hope in man, okay? Our, our hope and trust must be alone in the Lord. And it says that someone who puts their trust uh, in man um, will bear certain fruits, and that's described in, in verse 6. They'll be like a, a shrub in the desert uh, that will inhabit the parched places of the wilderness and a salt land which is not inhabited. So we get this graphic description of, of, of dryness, barrenness, and, and no fruit. Okay, uh, that's the, That is the result of putting one's trust in man and, and putting one's trust in the flesh. Then we get the contrast of verse 7 and 8 is the contrast of that. Verse 7 says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like... A tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river. And this reminds us, doesn't it, of Psalm uh, 1, Psalm 1, verse 3. And so here we get the contrast. But the one that trusts in the Lord will bear fruit, will be like the tree. So you don't have the dryness or barrenness here. You have, you have moisture, you have sustenance, you have fruit bearing whose leaf will be green. Uh, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. You know, there, there may be years of drought, but if our roots are, are deep, uh, we'll be preserved through it. There are times in the life when, when trials seem to continue on, and um, we are, you know, in difficulties. But if our roots are deep in the Lord, if our trust is in Him, He'll see us through, and ultimately we'll yield fruit. And then we get the well-known um, description of the heart of man and verse and God's dealings with man in verse 9 and, and 10. Uh, uh, this is often quoted uh, in gospel messages and, and, and otherwise. Verse 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So we're continuing on with this description of, of the heart of man, of the evil of man, specifically of uh, Judah, the sin of Judah, verse 1, but we could probably uh, uh, sort of broaden this and widen this out to include all of men, and for it's true of all men. Uh, there's a similar statement in chapter 16 of uh, Jeremiah, chapter 16, and uh, verse 12, and you have done worse than your fathers, for behold, each one follows the dictates of his own evil heart, so that no one listens to me. Well, that's a description. Uh, 
following the dictates of your own heart and, and not listening to the Lord. Uh, that's the definition of sin. So here we have it here in verse 9 of chapter 17. The heart is, is deceitful. Uh, that could be translated crooked. The idea in the Hebrew has the idea of crookedness versus straight. You know, going in a straight line. You know, sometimes people speak of, of being straight, you know, walking the straight and narrow and so on, uh, versus uh, the crooked way. Uh, the heart is crooked. It, it's natural bent. Its natural bent as fallen sinful beings is towards the crooked way, towards crooked crookedness. It doesn't matter who you are, you know, uh, great or small, Christian or non-Christian, uh, the heart, our heart is the same, our natural hearts. And then he goes on to say, Jeremiah goes on to say, and desperately wicked, or the English Standard Version has uh, desperately sick. Uh, the uh, another translation has beyond cure. The Derby translation similarly has incurable. It's it's sick, but the sick the sickness is incurable. Uh, it, it's not going to change, and that's that's something we need to realize is that our natural state, our natural heart, the flesh does not change. Even becoming a Christian is not cured. Okay, it's still there. Uh, it's still the same as it always was. Uh, my heart is just as bad now as when I was saved almost 50 years ago. But we thank God for his grace. We thank God for the gift of the Holy Spirit that allows us to walk in a way to have a measure of victory as we have our eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have a, a connected uh, verse. It's the statement of the Lord uh, sort of as a result of this. Verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. Okay, I test the mind. Uh, he says, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. That's actually a comfort, you know, that we know that God uh, God knows our heart. God knows our mind. He tests it. He searches it to give every man according to his ways. In Acts uh, chapter 15, uh, it says there, uh, the, the God who knows the heart. He's called the God who knows the heart. Literally in the Greek it's really one word, the heart-knowing God. That's in Acts chapter 15. He's the heart-knowing God. He, and we get several times in scriptures uh, a statement like this where God uh, goes through the earth searching. I think we have uh, in Chronicles in connection with Solomon. And he searches the hearts of men and tests them. And so we have, we have it here as well. Actually, the, the mind here, I, the Lord, search the heart and I test the mind. Literally in the Hebrew, it's the kidneys, the kidneys. But we don't have to understand our literal kidney, the organ. What it means is the inner parts, the inner parts uh, of man. That's the idea here. So, uh, although verse 10 is solemn, the fact that the Lord searches the heart and tests the mind, and he gives every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings, it's also comforting to know that, that God knows my heart. Uh, and so on. Solemn and comforting at the same time. In verse 11, it's a partridge that broods but does not hatch, so is he who gets riches but not by right. It will leave him in the midst of his days and at his end he will be a fool. So it's just an exhortation here uh, that if we make uh, covetousness or riches as our goal in life, we end up in, in the same state as a fool. Uh, it will leave him in the midst of the days. You know, as we say, often say, uh, you can't take it with you. You can't take it with you, you know. So we should be laying up treasures in heaven. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ himself taught that to us in the Gospels. And then we get Jeremiah's conclusion. It's very lovely. Uh, verse 12, a glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. That's lovely. So even as those who are fallen creatures, the people of God even, uh, we may be discouraged by our state and, and, and by our circumstances, we have this uh, resource, this recourse, uh, a glorious high throne from the beginning. And speaking of God's throne, the high, it's described as high, it's described as glorious. And the idea of a throne, first of all, is government, but it's also stability, you know. God's not uh, in heaven looking down on earth and nervous 
or anxious or pacing back and forth and biting his nails like we do. Okay, it's not the, the idea of the throne is stability, right? And, and, and God's government, and it's a glorious throne. And this is the place of our sanctuary. Now, especially as, as Christians, as believers, uh, we have the throne of grace. Heaven is open. The veil is torn. We can draw near. Uh, we can enter in at all times uh, before the Lord in, in prayer. Uh, we have a similar expression in Isaiah chapter 8, verses 12 to 14, uh, 14 or verse or I should say verse 13 and 14 of Isaiah chapter 8. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. He will be as a sanctuary but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Now, uh, the Apostle Peter quotes this in 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 15, where he says, uh, Sanctify the Lord Christ in your hearts. He, he connects it with Christ as being the Lord, the Lord of hosts. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse, verse 8, uh, describing the, the Jewish uh, unbelievers, that Christ was a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. But for those who believe, he's a sanctuary, that we can commit ourselves to him, that we have a sanctuary, and we have a sanctuary in heaven, and we have a throne in heaven, and not only that, we have a man in heaven who's our representative. He's our forerunner, our great high priest, our advocate, our mediator, and he's there on that throne. And so we have that resource. And so verse 13, uh, this says, O Lord, the hope of Israel all who forsake you shall be ashamed. So he's the hope of Israel. But then we have verse the next, the concluding um, uh, uh, clause in verse 13. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken, forsaken uh, the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Now, if you recall uh, from chapter 2, uh, Jeremiah speaks of the, of the fountain of liver, living waters there. If you remember that, chapter 2, uh, verse 13, uh, where uh, he says, For my people have committed two evils. Uh, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So we get it again here, um, that, um, that he is the fountain of living waters. Uh, man has have their own cisterns, their own resources, but they're broken cisterns, they're leaky cisterns, they're dry cisterns. But the Lord himself is the fountain of living waters. Remember the woman at the well in John uh, uh, chapter 4. The Lord said, you know, um, you could have asked of me and I would, I would have given you the gift of, of, of living water, like a fountain springing up. Uh, and so he's still that, the fountain of living waters. I should say the first part of the clause here, those who depart from me shall be written in the earth. Uh, that's just like we have uh, had in the opening verse where the, the pen, the iron stylus with the point diamond, where the sin was recorded uh, and uh, written down. And so we have it written down again, but here in the earth. And some have connected this verse uh, with um, what we have in John chapter 8 with the woman taken in adultery. Uh, you'll recall that. The woman was, take, it was taken uh, before the Lord Jesus, and they tried to uh, sort of catch the Lord Jesus in a contradiction. The law of Moses said she should, should be stoned, uh, but he was teaching grace and, give, and showing grace to sinners and receiving sinners. So they, they thought they had him in a contradiction, and, and, and the Lord Jesus knelt down, and he, he took his finger, it says, and he, he wrote in the ground. And there's a lot of speculation what the, the Lord Jesus wrote, uh, whether it was the, the, the Ten Commandments or whatever. But they all went out. All these Pharisees went out. The elders, they went out from the, from the oldest of them to the youngest of them because the older guys had more sin. right? And, and so this is exactly what we have here. That, and, and, and maybe there's, there's a reference to what we have here in John chapter 8, that those who depart from me shall be written in the earth, that they too were sinners. Remember, uh, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it? So this uh, brings us now, verse 14 to 18, we get uh, Jeremiah's prayer for deliverance. And I'm not going to go through it all, you can, you can read it for yourself. 
But we, at the end of the prayer, we have something that I should note, uh, where he's speaking of his enemies. He's praying for deliverance and for the Lord's intervention. Uh, 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 because, you know, he had served the Lord uh, and that he had spoken with his lips the words of the Lord. And he's asking them for the Lord to save him, to deliver him from their, their hatred and their plots. But then he says, in, in the middle uh, of verse 18, uh, the, the last clause, let them be dismayed, but do not let me be dismayed. Bring on them the day of doom and destroy them with double destruction. So he, <laughs> Jeremiah's praying for their destruction, for their doom. And this is what we call, theologically, what we call an imprecatory prayer, where uh, we pray, uh, where, or where you get this in the prophets, where, or in the Psalms, especially you get it in the Psalms, where uh, God's people are praying for uh, his judgment to fall upon their enemies. Now, this may be so for uh, the those in the Old Testament and the Old Covenant. But we're in a different dispensation now. We don't pray for the destruction of our enemies, okay? We don't pray imprecatory prayers. Some have argued, well, doesn't that, isn't that what Paul does, for example, in Galatians? You know, those who bring a, another gospel, if anyone brings another gospel, either me or an angel, let him be accursed, and we get it twice, a double anathema. No, it isn't anathema. It's a, it's a judgment, a curse. Uh, but... Uh, I believe that, that that's different. Paul's stating the judgment that will fall upon those who do such and such. That's different than uh, praying for a specific individual and asking God to judge them, in, in my opinion. And I don't believe we get this in the New Testament. You know, uh, to uh, we are to pray for our enemies, the Lord teaches us. So dispensations matter. Where, where we are in God's program matters. Now, when we come to the book of Revelation, chapter 6, we see the tribulation martyrs under the soul, under their souls, under the altar of God. And they say, how long, O Lord, until you uh, bring vengeance for our blood upon those who have, you know, martyred us? And so there's the call for vengeance. But uh, the, uh, the the martyrs in the tribulation, the Jewish martyrs, they'll be on the same ground as here, the Old Testament saints. But uh, it'll be following the rapture of the church. So we don't, you know... We don't uh, pray for vengeance. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. One slaps us on one cheek, we, we offer the other cheek. In theory, you know, like not all Christians do that. And sometimes it's hard. But uh, that's the Christian position. I think that's clear. So we don't pray imprecatory prayers. We don't pray that God will bring judgment upon our enemies. We pray for them. We pray that they will come to Christ. Uh, we, we, we uh, uh, you know, forgive them. Uh, that's what the Lord says, forgive them, and so on. So I think that's pretty clear. And then um, in verse 19 to 27, uh, there's some exhortations in connection with the Sabbath. I was debating whether I should do this on a separate video, but I think I'll just keep going with it. Um, because really, it's, a, it's an entirely different topic. It's a new occasion. We see in verse 19, And the Lord said to me, Go and stand in the gate of the children of the people by which the kings of Judah come in, and which they go out, and in all the gates of Jerusalem. So uh, Jeremiah was to stand in the gate of Jerusalem, and and, and um, where the kings uh, come and go, uh, or where they used to come and go, uh, where they go in and out. And basically, it's a it's an exhortation or a warning. Uh, we get it in verse 21, 21 uh, Take heed to yourselves and bear no burden. On the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem, nor carry a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, nor do any work, but hallow the Sabbath day as I commanded your fathers. But they did not obey, nor incline their ear, but they made their necks stiff, that they might not hear, nor uh, uh, might not hear, nor receive instruction. So um, it's essentially just that throughout the portion. And we get the concluding verse uh, 27. But if you'll not heed me to hallow the Sabbath day, such as not, as not carrying a burden when entering in the gates on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in its gates, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem 
and it shall not be quenched. So, uh, so judgment is threatened for not obeying the Sabbath. And indeed, if you come to the very last chapter of Second Chronicle, Chronicles, I think it's Chronicle, Second Chronicles, chapter thirty-six, it says one of the reasons why uh, Judah was carried into captivity into Babylon was that they didn't obey the the, the the Sabbaths of the land. Every seven years, the land was to lay fallow. It was it was to be the Sabbath of the land, and um, so the the number of years of their captivity, uh, 70 was according to the number of years that they failed to uh, obey obey that law. But here we're talking more about the seventh day Sabbath and that too uh, was God's uh, judgment against them for disobeying. Now, you know, we need to explain this because a lot of Christians, professing Christians, are confused about the Sabbath. And some try to put us under the Sabbath, the Sabbath laws, and they have all sorts of arguments for it. And some are actually Sabbatarians, like Seventh Day, Seventh Day Adventists, and they will um, actually observe Saturday, uh, which is actually the Sabbath. You know, the, the sixth day, not the seventh day. I mean, rather the seventh day. Uh, the seventh day is the is the Sabbath day, Saturday, uh, the Sunday, the Lord's what we call the Lord's Day is the first day of the week, or really the, the it's the eighth day, you know, the day of resurrection that Christians traditionally meant, uh, met uh, on that day. Um, but ones like the Adventists and, and try to make us, uh, or would they practice this and would have others practice it, to worship God uh, on Saturday, to observe the Sabbath law, you know, not to do any work and uh, abstain from any movements and, and all of this. Others, uh, and that's an error, that's incorrect, but others who are not Sabbatarians in that way, or Sabbatarians in another way, it's also wrong, is that they simply change the day. They say, now, the Sabbath is no longer on Saturday. It's now, the, the Lord's Day is the Sabbath, that the first day of the week, the eighth day, that is the Sabbath. Uh, the God has changed the day and, and, and made uh, the first day of the week into the Sabbath. So Sunday, in their reckoning, is the Sabbath. The God didn't cancel the Sabbath. He just changed the day in which it was observed. A lot of Christians, especially in Reformed uh, circles, uh, hold to that teaching. Both are wrong. Uh, the Christian is not under the Sabbath at all. But how do we understand it? You know, um, when we see... Uh, Jeremiah's strong uh, condemnation here of of those who were breaking the Sabbath. But when we come to the New Testament, what do we see? We see the Lord Jesus uh, um, uh, sort of criticizing and condemning the Pharisees because they took this too far and they were doing it for ulterior motives. They were doing it hypocritically because the Lord said, well, the Sabbath uh, wasn't created for man, but man for the Sabbath. And, and so they had all sorts of laws that they had added to this and, and used it to oppress the people for their own ulterior motives, for their own purposes. Um, but the Lord Jesus was also introducing uh, something new. You know, in Luke's gospel, uh, chapter 6, uh, in connection with the Sabbath, uh, when the disciples were picking uh, grain on the Sabbath, he said, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. He's Lord of the Sabbath. If he gave the Sabbath, uh, he can also cancel the Sabbath. He, and he can uh, allow what he feels needs to be allowed. Uh, and so that's one point uh, we should mention. The Lord Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Another occasion, um, they condemned the Lord Jesus uh, for... Uh, healing a man on the Sabbath, and that's in John's Gospel, chapter 5, and he healed a man, the man uh, uh, there at the uh, at the pool, um, and he was condemned uh, by the Pharisees for doing this, for working on the Sabbath. And the Lord's response uh, to this, let's look at uh, John chapter 5, verse 16. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. 
notice this, my father has been working until now and I have been working. So what the Lord's saying there is that the Lord could not rest on the Sabbath. Indeed, the Sabbath was broken when man fell. You know, God gave the Sabbath uh, to Adam in the original creation. But Adam sinned, man sinned, man fell. That broke the Sabbath. Because some say, okay, we're not under Jewish law of Sabbath, but we're under the original creational law of Sabbath. But, but no, uh, that law was broken. And God, that is the Father and the Son, have been laboring. That's what it says. My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. What? To bring about redemption. To bring about salvation. Okay, we need salvation. And, um, and and so this is the Lord's purpose now, not to put us under Sabbath, uh, but to to bring about a salvation for the Jewish people. They were specifically under the Sabbath, and this is what Jeremiah is speaking about here. If you look at Ezekiel uh, chapter twenty, Ezekiel chapter twenty, verse twelve, and it says there. Moreover, moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me, that they may know, uh, might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. So he's saying here, he gave them the Sabbath as a, sort of an, an identifying mark, sort of a, as a, a covenant or as a sign between them and me. That's the people of Israel. That's not us Gentiles. It's not man generally. But specifically here in Ezekiel 20, uh, it's the people of Israel. Uh, the Sabbath was given to them. And as far as we Gentiles, that the creational Sabbath that was in the uh, the original creation, that's broken. A man fell, sin came in, and the Father and the Son have been working hitherto to bring about, you know, the plan of redemption. We're not under Sabbath, and we could go further with this. I mean, people who would uh, endeavor to put us under the Sabbath law, uh, they don't even keep the law. Like if you look at uh, for example, Numbers 15, verse 32, uh, it says there, Now while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses. And so oh, this guy's gathering sticks, Moses. What should we, what should we uh, do with him? And, and so uh, the response of the Lord to Moses was, in verse 35, the man must be surely put to death, and all the congregation uh, shall stone him with stones outside the camp. So he's gathering sticks on the Sabbath. The, the judgment for breaking the law of the Sabbath in Israel was to be stoned with stones. Now, for us Christians, if we see our neighbor gathering sticks, he's raking his lawn, you know, he's doing yard work. Are we to, to get the neighborhood together and, 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 uh, and uh, present them before the neighborhood and, and pick up stones and, and kill him. We don't do that. We're not to do that. And if we, you know, we don't do that. If you put us under the law, then you're not actually keeping the law because the law said you had to stone the one for doing his yard work. Okay. And so those who uh, claim to be Sabbatarians claim to keep the Sabbath, claim to be under the law of the Sabbath. They don't really keep the, keep it. Okay. They, they don't really fulfill it as it recorded uh, in the scriptures. And uh, further uh, than that, there's a few more verses that will help us. Look at Colossians uh, chapter 2. I'm going a little longer than I, 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 I want to in these studies uh, right now, but I probably should have done this separately, this section. But anyway, we're almost done. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival of new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance or the body is Christ. So the Sabbaths were just a, a type or a shadow of Christ. And notice here it's plural, Sabbaths, because the Jews just didn't have one Sabbath. They had all sorts of Sabbaths, special Sabbaths. Uh, Sabbaths that were connected with the festival days and all sorts of things. Sabbaths of the land, which I already mentioned. Uh, we're not to keep any of those. And, and uh, even if we were to, or were supposed to, we couldn't. You know, we're not in the land of Israel. So, but, but be that as it may, the thing is, Paul is very clear. Uh, let no man judge you in this matter. 
Uh, these things are just a shadow of what was to come. And the shadow has come. Uh, the, the fulfillment of it, the, 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 the substance of it has come, who is Christ. He is the true Sabbath. And uh, this will bring us to our last thought in Hebrews uh, chapter 4, verse 3 and 9. If you look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3 and 9, this is the very argument. Notice verse 3. For we who have believed do enter into rest. We who have believed do enter into rest. Why do we enter into rest? Because the Lord Jesus accomplished redemption. He is the Sabbath. And if we've received him, we have entered into that rest by faith. We're in him. We're not under judgment. We have died. Okay, we've died in Christ. And so therefore the law, whether the original creation in Adam or whether the, the legal law under, under Moses, we're not under that. We've died uh, when the Lord Jesus was crucified and now we're in him. We are in him and we are justified. We have a righteousness before God. We have redemption. Okay, uh, That's what the Lord was working to bring about and now it's accomplished. And so again, verse 3, for we who have believed to enter into rest. And the other verse is in the same chapter, verse 9, Therefore, uh, there remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. There remains a rest for the people of God. Literally, uh, if you look at the Darby translation, it says a sabbatism. There remains a sabbatism. That's in the future. You know, in the millennium, in the eternal state, or if we should die and go to heaven, you know, there is a rest for us as believers. There's one now entering into Christ, and there will be one eternally uh, in the future, and then verse ten, he was uh, entered. He who has entered his rest, his capital H Christ, has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from his. So we have a rest. We have a Sabbath. It's Christ. He is the substance. Well, may the Lord encourage you today as you uh, meditate on these things. You continue uh, to study through the book of Je Jeremiah. Amen.